That song right there just takes me somewhere. I know it does for you as well. I just can feel it. I can just sense it that we know that our victory is in Jesus' name. And when we begin to praise him and we begin to worship him, he shows up in our situation. The scripture says that the Father seeketh such to worship him, those that worship him in spirit and truth. So if you want to send up an SOS, if you want to get God to show up in your situation, you don't have to go find him. All you got to do is find a place to start worshiping, and God will find you. Hello, somebody. I hope that encouraged you today. Well, I am just excited that you all are here joining us today. Uh, the Tabernacle Church just loves you, and we want you to know that we're praying for you. We just want to be an encouragement to you. And I want you to know that you're not here today by accident, by incident, or circumstance. The scripture says the steps of a good man, a good woman, are ordered by God. That means God has ordained for you to be here today. So that means that we have a word that's going to encourage you. We're in a series that is exciting. We're in a series that's called How to Live Through a Bad Day. And we're in part two of this three-part series on how to live through a bad day. Just last week, we talked about that one way we can live through a bad day is by helping others. Because we recognize that when we help others, it distracts us from our own needs and our own problems. When we help other people, it helps us to find the solution to our problem as we're helping them with a solution to their problem. When we help other people, it helps to put our situation in perspective as it relates to what's going on in the ultimate world that we live in. Also, we talked about what are three ways that we can help other people when they're going through their difficult day, when they're going through a hard day, and we learned that we can offer them stability through God's word, the immutable word of God that doesn't change and gives them certainty. We can offer them support by doing life with them and walking alongside of them and encouraging them to keep on keeping on. We can offer also salvation to people, the gift, the free gift. Well, it costs Jesus everything, but the gift is free to us, offering people salvation so they're not just focusing in on their temporal circumstance, but they know that there's an eternity that we're situated in. When you think about having a bad day, how many of you have ever thought this? And oftentimes I believe that we do when we're dealing with a really bad day. We start to wonder if God is even paying attention to us. We feel like God has even abandoned us. And we start to ask questions like, God, where are you? Am I talking to anybody this morning? That you've ever been in such a difficult situation that you ask God the, the question, where are you? Well, we're going to help you today if that's where you're at. We're going to give you something today that's going to help you to be able to move past just asking that question of God. As a matter of fact, we're going to take a look at our foundational scripture today, which is found in the book of Hebrews, chapter 12, verse 2. We're going to read it, and it says this. Keep your eyes on Jesus, who both began and finished this race we're in. Study how he did it, because he never lost sight of where he was headed that exhilarating finish in and with God. He could put up with anything along the way. Now, he could put up with anything, but we can't. He was able to put up with the cross, shame, whatever. And now he's there in the place of honor, right alongside of God. Notice what the writer of Hebrews says. He says, keep your eyes on Jesus. When you're going through a difficult situation, when you're going through a difficult day, you need to keep your eyes on Jesus. Don't be distracted by everything else that's going on. Put your eyes intently focus in on him because he was able to not only start his race, but he was also able to finish his race. And then he says this. He says, study it study what Jesus did and so I'm inviting all of you today to study with us the the most difficult time of Jesus's earthly ministry on that very bad Friday I know we call it good Friday but it wasn't good for Jesus it may have been good for us but it was the most difficult time in Jesus's life and it's when he's hanging on the cross and what we're gonna do is we want to study what did Jesus do to get through the most difficult time of his earthly ministry. And I believe that we can learn some valuable lessons by looking at the last seven statements that Jesus makes on the cross. And if we would study them and look at them intently, I believe it's going to reveal to us some lessons that we can learn and apply to our lives that's going to help us, help you, help me get through our difficult day. 
And so in particular, we're going to start looking at two passages of Scripture today. The first passage of Scripture is found in Matthew's Gospel. Matthew chapter 27, beginning at verse 46. And the Bible says, at about 3 o'clock, Jesus calls out with a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lemma sabbatani, which interpreted means this, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Wow. Jesus asked the question, God, why have you abandoned me? Can you just imagine the tension in that question? The same tension we've had, especially when the Bible doesn't record that God even answers Jesus' question, why have you abandoned me? That really shows Jesus' humanity. Remember that Jesus is 100% God. And he's 100% man. And in in this moment, we see his humanness come through. I I know some of you think it's weak to ask God the question, where are you? I know some of you feel like it's less than being spiritual than to say, you know what, God, are you not paying attention to me? But even Jesus asked that question. And I want to put that question in the context of the other statements that Jesus makes preceding this. And in the other statements, Jesus doesn't seem so human. As a matter of fact, we kind of see his divinity coming through. Think about the first statement that he makes on the cross. He's hanging there on the cross after they pierced nails in his hands and pierced nails in his feet and put a crown of thorns on his head and whipped him with a cat of nine tails and pierced him in the side with a spear. Jesus, while hanging on the cross, he says, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. How many of you know it takes more than human strength to forgive like that? But Jesus, in his divinity, he's able to forgive like that. And then we have Jesus hanging on the cross. Uh, here he is to his left and to his right are two criminals. And one criminal is insulting him and blaspheming God, but yet the other criminal is recognizing that Jesus is the Messiah and Jesus takes a moment in the midst of his pain and his most difficult hour To not think about himself, but to help the other criminal and minister to him that today the criminal will be with him in paradise. I mean, that's a powerful thing to be able to do. And then we have Jesus also while they're hanging on the cross. He looks down and he sees his mother, Mary, and he sees the disciple, the beloved one, John. And Jesus comforts those closest to him. And he says, woman, behold thy son. And he says, son, behold thy mother. Here he is comforting those closest to him in his moment of the most difficult day and the most difficult hour. And yet that's like many of us when we're going through our difficulties and we're going through our bad times. I mean, we're running like we're superheroes. We seem super spiritual. Then all of a sudden, come on somebody, the reality of what we're dealing with, the the heaviness of what we're dealing with, the weight of the situation that we find ourselves in, it starts to really weigh heavy on us. And then Jesus utters these words, Eli, Eli, Sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? The reality of it comes. The rubber meets the road. And not only that, the next words that Jesus utters on the cross is, I thirst. I have a need. I'm human. I don't know what to do. I can't help myself right now. I thirst. Have you ever been there? You're going through your your difficult time and you seem like you were running the race well and all of a sudden you hit that proverbial brick wall. God, where are you? I'm thirsty. But there's a tension here in Jesus' question. A tension that we got to elevate to the surface. Not only does Jesus say, God, why have you abandoned me? But he says, my God. That simple pronoun, my, is so powerful. Those simple two letters, my, that one syllable word, my, it shows ownership. And it helps us to recognize that Jesus knew that he was in continued relationship with the Father. He says, my God, hello, somebody. How many of you know when you're going through your go-through and you're asking a question and God is silent and God isn't answering, he is still your God. You are still in relationship (laughs) with him. And Jesus elevates that. I don't know where you are, but you're still my God. I still got confidence in you. 
I still have confidence in our relationship. See, you, you understand that as you are in your most difficult time, even as Jesus, you can get to a point where you ask the question, and it's human to ask the question, why? There's something else in there about Jesus still having some confidence. And then we get to the sixth statement that Jesus makes on the cross that we want to look at today, which gives us some real insight. It's found in John chapter 19, verse 30. It's simple. Jesus says, it is finished. Jesus' focus shifts. It shifts from receiving an answer from God to focusing in on God's purpose for him. You see, in the Greek, it is finished. comes from the Greek root word telos. Telos is the root of teleology, which means the purposiveness of a thing. It is the purpose of a thing. So actually, Jesus is saying, I have accomplished my purpose. Jesus shifts from, God, where are you, to, God, I have accomplished your purpose. I want you to understand it's something powerful, empowering about us, recognizing that regardless of what we're going through in our most difficult day, that God has a purpose. Hello, somebody. That God is working something out. That God is working something to a designated end. And it means that our pain has purpose and our struggle has significance and sometimes we got to be like Jesus and we got to shift somebody say shift here's what I want us to understand here's our main point today when you don't get an answer when you've asked a question over and over and you don't get an answer find assurance in a God who has a purpose in your pain when you don't get the answer, when you're asking all of those why questions, have you abandoned me? Are you paying attention to me? Where are you? After we get through going through that, then we got to like shake ourselves like Jesus. And we got to find assurance. And that the God we serve. We got to understand God's attributes enough to realize that God is working something out. That God is beyond our understanding. And, and, I, and I can really personally relate to this here. You know, if you've ever really experienced something difficult in your life, you, you've gotten to the place where you want an answer. I, I remember when I had back surgery, and, and the pain came from nowhere. The doctors couldn't figure out what happened to me back in, in about 2005. No one could figure out what was wrong with me. And I was like, God, why? And God never answered the why. And I started shifting my focus. God, what's your purpose for my life? And even as I started to come out and, and you know, I came out on the other side and the back surgery was successful. And I started gaining strength and, and, and started to, uh, uh, you know, re-enter regular life and, and, and enter into a sense of normalcy again. There will be times and periods, and even to this day sometimes, I'll experience a pain in my back. And I'll start to ask the question, why does this pain come? Where did this pain come from? Why now? And my wife will, will uh, hear me ask that question because usually I'm saying it to her like, honey, I don't understand why I'm hurting. And she'll say to me, Calvin, just, just take a Tylenol. Just take a Motrin. And I'll say, no, I don't want to take a Tylenol. I don't want to take a Motrin. I want to know why I'm hurting. She'll say, Calvin, I know you want to know why you are hurting. But... Until you figure that out, and if you never figure that out, take the Tylenol, take the Motrin, and the pain will subside. Because there was some assurance that if I understood that the medicine could help me get through the pain even without answering the question. And I know sometimes it's easier said than done because something in us, in our humanity, wants to know why. If there's anybody in the Bible who exemplifies what's going on here in Jesus' difficult day, if there's anyone in the Bible who we can identify with that's having a really bad day and dealing with pain and wants an answer to what's going on, it is the person of Job. In the book of Job, we learn about Job. Many of us have heard a lot about Job. Uh, we learn about Job in the book of Job, which is the oldest book of the Bible. It's the first book. And I know when you look in your Bible, you say, no, preacher, it's not Job. You, you're messing up. It's Genesis. Well, I know Genesis is the first book in our Bible. But the oldest book, the first book of the Bible is the book of Job. 
See, the Bible is put in categorical order and not necessarily chronological order. And the book of Job is categorized in the book of poetry with the book of Psalms and Proverbs and Ecclesiastes and the Song of Solomon and you have Job. Those are called the poetic books not because they rhyme but because of the structure of the book. And here we begin to learn about Job's life. We learn that Job was a devout man, that Job was a prosperous man, that Job was a man of status, that Job had a beautiful family. And it seems like all the blessings of God was on Job's life. But then as you're reading the book of Job, the, the scene changes, and there's this scene in heaven where the angels are before God. And then there's another angel that we call Satan or Satan who also appears before God. And God happens to be bragging on his servant Job. He begins to talk about how Job walks upright before him and how Job serves him. And then Satan says to God, he remember, he's the accuser of the brethren. Now remember, Job doesn't know anything about this scene that's taking place in heaven. He doesn't know there's a conversation being had about him. He's just going on about his daily life, enjoying the fruits from the Lord. Satan says to God, the only reason that Job is serving you, the only reason that Job is worshiping you is because you blessed him. You've got a hedge of protection around him, and who wouldn't serve a God who's doing everything for them? And he challenges God. Let me get at him, and I promise you, Job will curse you. And God has confidence in Job. God says, no, he won't. And he allows Satan to have access to Job with this condition. You can do whatever you want, but you can't touch his life. And so Job loses everything. Some marauders show up. They slaughter all of his flock. They burn up his land. A storm arises, and, and where his children are gathering, the house collapses on them. So he loses his wealth. He loses his resources. He loses his children. Ultimately, his body is afflicted with sores and diseases, and he's got scabs all over his body. He begins to reek of a stench. No one wants to be around him. He finds himself taking pottery and trying to scrape the scabs off of the sores. And the only person that seems to be left is his wife. Now, I said God said that Job could, have, could lose everything except for his life. But it seems like the enemy said, we're going to just let him also keep his wife. <laughs> Somebody going to catch that. Because, you know, sometimes our spouses can, you know, dig in. Especially when we're going through our go-through, sometimes you may have a spouse that's not supportive. Which happens to be the case with Job. At, at one point, uh, his wife says to him, while Job is sitting in, in, in sackcloth and ashes and, and he's pondering what's going on, she says to him, literally, why don't you curse God and die? Now, that's a good support from a wife, right? And I can imagine all the devils were like, Satan, you made the right decision letting her just stay behind. But there's something powerful, I believe. You see, losing a wife, losing a spouse is tantamount, tantamount to losing your own life. And so he's left with his wife. And all of a sudden, Job is mourning the loss of everything. And then something significant happens. He has these three friends. And people wonder, well, how, you know, why is his friend still left? Many Jewish scholars believe that friends are also tantamount to losing one's own life, to lose a friend. And they didn't have Instagram. They didn't have Facebook. They didn't have email back in those days. And his friends lived far away from him. But somehow they knew. Somehow each of them knew individually without talking to each other that something was going on with their friend. Don't you know sometimes you just have that intuition? Haven't you ever had a friend of yours just come to your mind and you pray for them? Or you have a friend of yours come to your mind and you send them a text or you give them a phone call because they just came to your mind? And somehow God puts Job on their minds. And they show up at Job's house while Job is going through his go-through. While Job is dealing with the most difficult, I mean, a day that I'm sure we can't even comprehend to lose your children, to lose your resources, to have your body afflicted with sores, to be, have so much stench that no one wants to be around you, and his friends show up. And you know what they do when they show up? Nothing. 
You know, we can learn a lesson for that when we're trying to help people who are trying to live through a bad day. Sometimes we just need to say nothing. Because in the Jewish tradition, when you were visiting someone who was mourning, you stayed silent until they spoke. Because they might not be in a place where they're ready to speak right now. Like, I'm still trying to deal with this. Like, I'm still trying to process all this. And I don't really need to hear anybody's advice right now. And so for a week, they just sit next to their friend in silence. Sometimes we just need to be silent. Sometimes we just need to be good listeners when we're trying to help somebody else get through a difficult day. And after a week, Job finally gets up to speak. And when Job gets up to speak, he starts to accuse God. And when his friends, they they are taken back by Job's, you know, accusations toward God. Job just believes that God must somehow be an unjust God or or God must be slipping in his duties because Job is is convinced that he hasn't done anything wrong to deserve it. But his friends, on the other hand, they believe that Job, according to the way we understand our theology, that God blesses people who do right and God curses people who do wrong. And so they begin to defend God to Job and say, Job, you had to do something wrong because there's no way that this could happen to you because God is just but they don't know Job's life and Job is looking through the Rolodex of his life and he's saying I have I repent I do sacrifices I walk out the word he's like I haven't done anything and he goes three rounds with these three guys each time the argument and debate builds and Job never moves from his position but I haven't done anything wrong why has this befallen me and his friends don't move off of their position you had to do something wrong Job because that's the only reason that something like this could have happened to you but finally Job says this in Job chapter 30 he says I call to you O God but you never answer. When I pray, you pay no attention. Has anybody ever been there where you called out to God, but you didn't get an answer? But I want you to notice something in the statement that Job makes. It's indicative of us being in our emotions. Notice the exaggeration of his language. He says, but you never answer. How many of you know that's not true, that God never answers? Have you ever been like that when you've been in your emotions, maybe with your spouse or your children? You never do this. You always do that. You know, we go to these extremes, and yet they're really not true. They're exaggerations. But God, you never answer when I pray. You pay no attention to me. And so we get to a place where we're looking for an answer. But what do we do when God is silent? Or what do we do when God decides to answer us but not answer our question? And so Job has been talking a lot, (laughs) going back and forth with his friends, and he finally says something to God, you'll never answer me. Job's about to get what he wants, a response from God. And we see this here in verse 38. We get a response from from God to Job, verse 1 and 5. It says, then the Lord spoke to Job out of the storm he said who is this that obscures my plans with words without knowledge brace yourself like a man I will question you and you shall answer me where were you when I laid earth's foundation I love that where were you at when I laid the foundation tell me if you understand who marked off its dimensions God is sarcastic he says surely you know then he says this and Uh, Job 38, down a little further. He says, God says this to Job, have you ever comprehended the vast expanses of the earth? Have you ever thought about it? Tell me if you know all this, what is the way to the abode of light? Where does light go? Where does light live? He says, and where does darkness reside? I'm sure you know that, Job. Tell me where to find darkness. Can you take them to their places? Do you know the path of their dwellings? Surely you know For you were already born. I like this here, this humor. You have lived so many years. You're 70 years old, Job, and surely you've lived long enough to know all this. You know what it reminds me of? It reminds me of of this interaction that happened um, back in 1999. Uh, Have you guys ever heard of of Corey Benjamin? 
Corey Benjamin used to play for the Chicago Bulls. And back in 1999, after the Michael Jordan had retired, Corey Benjamin was at practice talking to some of the older guys about how he beat Michael Jordan in a one-on-one game. And Corey Benjamin, he just kept on talking trash and how he would school Jordan, what he would do to Jordan if they ever played a one-on-one. But there was a guy there named Randy Brown. And Randy Brown happened to pass the information on to Michael Jordan. He said, Mike, there's this guy, you know, Benjamin, he's been talking trash about what he'd do to you on the court in a one-on-one game. So one day, unbeknownst to uh, Corey Benjamin, Michael Jordan shows up to the practice. Mike's like, I heard you've been talking about me. You said you could beat me in a game of one-on-one. Come on, let's come out here. And what began to happen was a basketball clinic. Mike was shooting three-pointers. Mike was taking him to the rim. Mike would go to the rim, step back, and pull up a short J. Then Mike would start telling him where he was going to go on the court and make the shot. Hello, somebody. Then Mike started telling him, when you reach, I'm about to teach. When you reach, I'm about to teach. And what Mike did was exploited this young man who was talking trash about him until Mike showed up. And that's what happened when Job. Job had a whole lot of trash to talk. He was talking about this and that, but then God showed up. And he put Job in his place. He said, let me give you a virtual tour of the universe, Job. You know, we're all doing things virtual these days because of this pandemic that we're in shelter in place. And God takes Job on a virtual tour. Let me show you the constellations. Let me show you the universe. Let me show you this earth. Let me show you the mountains. Like, if you can explain to me how everything works, Job, he schools Job. And then Job starts to realize something. Job starts to realize who God really is. I love this. When we move in chapter 40 of Job, verses 3 and 4, it says this. This is how Job responds to God. It says, then Job answered the Lord, I am unworthy. How can I reply to you? He says, I put my hand over my mouth. In other words, I'm about to shut up. I'm going to help myself shut up. I'm going to cover my mouth because I've been talking too much trash. I don't understand you. I don't know you like I thought I knew you. And that's the same thing that Michael Jordan told Corey. After he beat him, he said, now go sit down in the corner somewhere. You see, that's how God will put us in our place. And, and, And Job had no idea. He thought he knew about God. But after this virtual tour, After God is explaining the things to him and questioning him and interrogating him, Job's like, I'm just going to keep my mouth shut. Job chapter 42, verse 1 through 5 further illustrates what Job is starting to realize about God and about himself. And Job says this. It says, then Job replied to the Lord, I know that you do all things. No purpose of yours can be thwarted. You ask, who is this that obscures my plans without knowledge? He says, me? (laughs) Surely I spoke of things I did not understand. Haven't we done that before? We don't really understand God. We think we understand him, but Job has an encounter with God where he realized, God, I don't understand you. Like, you're too lofty for me. God, your thoughts are not my thoughts. God, your ways are not my ways. Too wonderful for me to know. My ears had heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. Job realizes, I had just heard about you. But now because of all of this, because of this encounter, I've seen you clearly. I see you as you are. And it's from this encounter with God that God, that Job learned something he never knew. Job never gets the answer to his question. Job never gets his I, his why answered. But instead he finds an assurance that God is a God that has a purpose in the midst of his pain. You see, that's what happens when when we get to experience God as he, we may have the question, why God, why have you forsaken me? Why why have you left me, abandoned me, God? Where are you? Are you thinking about me just like Job? But Job finally gets to a place where he doesn't get an answer, but he gets God. See, that's the blessing. When we start to really push in and ask God why, the blessing is that even if God doesn't answer our why, we can find out that there's God. And there's something satisfying about that. There's something that satisfies our soul. Anybody ever been there? 
that you got to a place when God revealed himself to you that the why didn't even matter? That you didn't need that answer? Like Jesus on the cross, why? Then there's the assurance. Job realizes that God has a purpose for everything. And there's three attributes that, that is revealed to Job in this passage here. Chapter 42, verse 1 through 5, there's three attributes that, that we can learn from that would help us get through our bad day. I want to look at these three simple things, uh, profound things, I should say, about God. It's really where our Christian theology is anchored in. And then the first thing that we see that Job learns about God that will help us uh, live through, not get through, not make it through a bad day, is that God is all-powerful. The theological term is omnipotent. God is omnipotent. That means that God is omnipowerful, or God has all power. He's got all power in heaven and in earth. And that, that is a reassuring thing to me if I'm going through a bad day. Because in times of uncertainty, I, I'd rather have hope in a God that is all powerful than to have certainty in myself with all of my limitations. And I'll say that again. I'd rather have hope in a God who's all-powerful than certainty in my limitations. And why do I say it that way? Because people like all these Christians, you guys got all this hope. You just got blind faith. You just believe. But I'd rather have hope that God can do something. I'd rather have hope that God could use his power. I'm reminded of a time in our church where there was a member of our church who had a son who ended up in the hospital on life support. Medical professionals have pretty much given up on him. A member of our church, he called out to the leaders of the church and we began to pray and we even went to the hospital to pray. And, and as we began to pray, God started to move. This man was taken off life support system. This man was able to regain a regular life. He even came to this church and came to a men's group and men's event and we got to see the power of God right before us. Kind of like Lazarus, you know. Lazarus came back from the dead and then he spent time with the people, fellowship and had a party at his house. We seen this young man at death's door and we prayed for him and God raised him off of that bed and he was amongst us and we saw that God was powerful. It's like what Paul says in Colossians. For everything, absolutely everything, everything got started in him and finds its purpose in him. He was there before any of it came into existence and holds it all together right up to this moment. God, Paul says that God got the whole world in his hand and he's holding everything together. And he's the same God that created the heavens and the earth. And he's all powerful. And he can do what he wants to do. And he can even bring somebody back from death's door. We saw the power of God. So I'd rather hope in a God that's all powerful than trust me. Too many people say, you know what, I don't know about that God thing, but I know about me. Well, you trust your own limitations then. You got certainty in that. <laughs> but I've got hope in a God that's all powerful. The second attribute of God that we see that Job finds out about is that God is all-knowing. That means he's omniscient, omni, all-knowing. God isn't just smart. God isn't just intelligent. God is all-knowing. It says this in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 13. He knows about everyone, everywhere. Everything about us is bare and wide open to the all-seeing of our living God. Nothing can be hidden from him. God knows the end from the beginning. The problem is, you and I, we're often stuck in the middle. And we're like, God, we don't know the end from the beginning. We know the middle. We know what's going on right now. And we don't know what to do. You know, that's true. But I'd rather trust, rather trust my unknown future to an all-knowing God. How many of you can trust your unknown? I don't know what tomorrow brings. I don't know what tomorrow holds, but I know who holds tomorrow, an all-powerful God in his hand. And even what we're going through right now as a country, as a global society, we still know that God 
He's holding the whole world in his hands. We still know God knows the end from the beginning, even when we don't know. And I'm okay that God knows things that I don't know. I'm good with that. You know, I think like this. If God, if I could know everything God knows, then God wouldn't be a God worth me worshiping. If I could understand everything that God understands, then he wouldn't be a God worth me worshiping. It makes sense to me that God's thoughts are beyond my thoughts and his ways and comprehension are behind, beyond mine. You know, I'll think about the, the young man who God raised off the deathbed, brought him amongst us. I often think about this. It was about a year or so later, two years later, that that same young man that we watched God raise up from the bed brought him out of the hospital, all the tubes taken out of him. That same young man ended up dying. I don't understand it. I, I don't know. It leaves you scratching your head. God, you raised them up here. Then this happens. But I'm reminded of what the prophet Isaiah says in Isaiah 57. It says, good people seem to pass away before their time. But it only seems that way to us humans. Because when you go on to read Isaiah 57 and 1, he goes on to say, but they were being protected from some evil up ahead. See, we don't know what was going on up ahead for that young man's life. But what I do know is that that man didn't have a relationship with God before God raised him up out of that deathbed. But after that, he had a relationship with God. And who knows what would have happened had he lived longer. We don't know. We can't understand it. We can't comprehend it. But God knows everything, the end from the beginning. We're in the middle. And sometimes we just don't get it. I want to encourage you when you're trying to go through your bad day, when you're trying to live through your bad day, that God knows. He is all-knowing. And the third thing we learn from Job about God's attributes that will help us live through a bad day is that God is ever-present. The theological term is he's omnipresent. He's all-present. He's everywhere. The scripture says it this way. God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. God is ever-present. He is everywhere. And Job realized that after God took him on this virtual tour, he said, like, God is everywhere. God is throughout the universe. Wherever you are, God is there. And there's something powerful about knowing that God is there. Because if God is everywhere, then I can stand up against anything that's coming at me. You know, even when we have difficulties, even after we see God in all of his power raise somebody up off a deathbed, and after we have to ponder, well, how come this life come to an end and we don't really understand it, the thing that gives us comfort, even when we don't get an answer, is to know that God is present. And God may not give us what we want, but God will always give us what we need. And what we always need is for our God to be ever present when we're in our trouble. God may not always tell you why you're in your predicament, but he'll give you what you need because in his presence is joy. He'll give you joy to get through your difficult day. In his presence, there's liberty. He'll deliver you from all of the oppression and the depression that comes upon people in their times of difficulty because he is there. He may not give you what you want, but God will always give you what you need, and his presence is always there. And what I love about the story of Job is that Job was, that God was present in Job's life the whole time, yet he had only heard of him. How many of us are walking around and God is ever present and we don't know it? But once Job began to call out to God and God answers him, Job finally sees God as he is. And that's the gift that means that we don't need an answer to the question. It's when we get to see God who was ever present, be present before us, it gives us the assurance that God has a purpose for us in the midst of our pain. I don't got my question answered, but I got a God. I don't have my why answered, but I got a God. And as much as you think that answer to the question will satisfy you, Nothing will satisfy you more than knowing who God really is. My prayer for you this morning.
that you would see God as he really is. Like Isaiah saw him high and lifted up. That's how Job ended up seeing. Chapter 42, verse 6, read it when you get time. It said, after Job saw God as he really was, it said he sat down, shut his mouth, changed his mind about things. Pray that you see God. He really is. Omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent. That as that reality comes to you, will not need the answer to the why because you would have found assurance in the almighty God as a purpose for all things God bless you praise God what a wonderful message if right now you're on this stream and you're like I want to know God for myself if you want to get into a relationship with the God that created heaven and earth, right now is the perfect moment to do that. The Bible says if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that you'll be saved and that you'll be back in right relationship with him. You can do that right now in your living room, in your bedroom, wherever you are, whenever you're listening to this message. And if you say that prayer, would you just comment in the thread, I did it. I believe, and someone will reach out to help you continue to make those next steps in your journey. We thank you so much for joining us today, for listening to this message, for having the hope that comes from only knowing the, the all-living God, the mighty God that does not change. We just encourage you to continue to join us on these Sunday mornings. We also encourage you that if you have a need that you come out on Tuesday at 5 p.m. to the Hope Center. We continue to encourage you to continue to connect with us on Wednesdays for our Bible study, followed by our small groups. There are many of you that have expressed interest in discovering your purpose and knowing how you can make a difference. We encourage you to sign up for Growth Track that's still going on every single week. And as always, we thank you for joining with us to worship and for the word. And we just ask that you continue to support this ministry through worship, through giving. We love you so much. We miss you all. We pray that you would share this message with someone else that needs to be encouraged during this season. God bless you all is our prayer. Have a great week. <laughs>